Excellent. So ventilation is just the movement of air, air flow, basically breathing. And then respiration was the gas exchange that happens as a consequence of ventilation. So we'll start off with this overarching question. Now air moves through the airway in a similar way to how blood moves through the vasculature. Knowing this, what do you think drives airflow? What might slow down airflow? So given what we know about the principles of bulk flow, what might speed up or facilitate airflow and what might slow down airflow? Pressure gradient, yeah. So pressure gradient will facilitate airflow. The bigger the gradient, the more the flow, yep. Resistance might do what? Slow it down, right? So resistance to flow, which would be the radius or the diameter, um, and then the length would also impede or slow down breathing. So that those same principles that we talked about that governed how liquids moved in a tube, how blood moves in our vasculature, will also apply here as we speak about how air moves through the airways, okay? So let's start by describing the forces here. So air moves in and out of the lungs via bulk flow, right? According to those pressure gradients. And so in order for air to move into our lungs, it must be moving from a place of high pressure to a place of low pressure. This is all passive movement. All we do is we create the environment that will then facilitate um, the flow of air from high to low pressure. So during inspiration, there is higher pressure in the atmosphere and lower pressure in our lungs, down in the alveoli. And so that creates a driving force for air to go from the atmosphere down into our lungs. During expiration, that is reversed and there's higher pressure in our lungs and lower pressure out in the atmosphere. And so that creates a driving force for that air to move out of our lungs and out into the atmosphere. We also wanna describe here the functional residual capacity and this is the volume of air that's lingering in the lungs. So if everyone takes a nice big deep breath and then you release that breath, at the end of your most forced expiration, there will still be a small amount of air in your lungs. And that is what we call the functional residual capacity. So it is uh, physically impossible to completely empty your lungs from all the air. This functional residual capacity is gonna be really important to maintaining those pressure gradients and maintaining that airflow, okay? So let's start by describing the pressures here and then we'll move on to uh, kind of see how they work with each other. So the atmospheric pressure, which we denote with that capital P and ATM, is the pressure that's outside in the air that we're breathing in, okay? Um, we're gonna speak about how we derive the value for that atmospheric pressure. Um, and then how we can use that value to then relate our physiology to that value. There's also the intra-alveolar pressure. This is the pressure that's inside the air in our alveoli. And then there's the intrapleural pressure. This is the pressure that's in that pleural sac, right? So if you remember, we talked about that pleural cavity, the visceral and parietal layers, and then they, that forms a sac that's around our lungs. And there's a small amount of pressure in there that we call the intrapleural pressure. And then finally, there's the transpulmonary pressure, sometimes called the distending pressure. And this is the difference between the pressure that's in our alveoli and the pressure that is in the intrapleural cavity. It's very important that we have um, a difference in this pressure. This, these pressures should never be the same. And again, we'll move on to speak about why. So this is the distending pressure across the lung wall that helps to keep our lungs inflated and prevent them from collapsing. Okay. Now, in terms of the atmospheric pressure, out in the uh, air, the environment that we're breathing, the pressure at sea level is about 760 millimeters of mercury. If we go all the way to the top of maybe Mount Everest, the uh, pressure up there would be about 30, 32 millimeters of mercury. And so there's a large degree of variability depending on where we are physically, um, what, what height we are. Some people live at higher altitudes than others. And so there's really no set point in terms of establishing the atmospheric pressure. So what the physiologists who kind of first started describing this decided to do is set the atmospheric pressure at zero, right? God bless their souls. So they've just made things a lot easier for us 
And we can just say, regardless of where we are, our atmospheric pressure is zero, okay? Now, it's gonna get higher if we go lower underneath sea level and lower as we go higher in the atmosphere, but we're gonna just stick with this zero in terms of understanding how this relates to our physiology. Okay, let's look at the intraalveolar pressure. So the pressure that's actually in the air that's in our lungs. Um, this is given relative to the atmospheric pressure. So, so that's kind of why we decided to set the atmospheric pressure at zero and then we can look at our physiology relative to that set point of zero. So this is going to vary with the different phases of respiration, but as we kind of described earlier, the general, the general trend that we see is that while we are inspiring, there is a negative alveolar pressure, meaning that the atmosphere has a greater pressure than what's in our alveolar, right? So if we set the atmospheric pressure at zero, then in order for our alveoli to have a lower pressure, it's gonna to have to be a negative value, okay? During expiration, the reverse is true. Again, we're setting the atmospheric pressure at zero, and in order for what's in our lungs to be greater than that atmospheric pressure, it's gonna be a value above zero, okay? I hope that makes sense. So the difference between our alveolar pressure and the atmospheric pressure is what drives ventilation, all right? And I, I'll keep repeating this trend that air is going to flow from high pressure to low pressure, okay? And so when we look at that set point of zero, we can describe what's happening in our lungs relative to that set point. 